Tonight, the Royal Shakespeare Company premieres its stage adaptation of Anthony Burgess's novel A Clockwork Orange, some 17 years after Stanley Kubrick's film version was withdrawn from British cinemas at the request of the director himself following death threats against his family. Burgess's savage prophetic satire, telling the story of young Alex and his gang, the Droogs, indulging in an orgy of motiveless rape and violence, was bound to be morally shocking whichever way you told it. But while the book used an invented language to distance the reader from the violence, on screen the pictures shouted louder than the words and drowned out any philosophical discussion of the individual's right to choose between evil and good. Well, nearly 20 years after the film, the RSC returns very much to the original story in an adaptation by Burgess himself, directed by Ron Daniels. But, like the film, the look of the play is enormously important. Daniels has decided to set the story in a timeless urban hell, and to get it, he's worked in close collaboration with the award-winning designer Richard Hudson. The Late Show followed Hudson as he developed the set for Burgess's extraordinary tale of ultraviolence and government repression. When you're working with, with designers of, of such talent as Richard has, uh, what you do is you talk and talk and talk and you discuss ideas endlessly and you look at photographs and you look at, you look at research material and you just talk about the ideas in the play. Quite a big influence on the, the way it looks comes from the pictures of Gilbert and George. Um, and then a lot of research into sort of really dreary costume, like um, nurses' uniforms and policemen's outfits and riot squad helmets and um, prisoners, prison staff, doctors, all that kind of thing. The Clock of Orange is one of the great um, monuments, cultural monuments of the 60s. And one of the things that is terribly important is that as we um, go about setting up our version of it, it is entirely um, of the 90s. And so um, the, the development of the production has happened gradually through uh, Richard's vision of it, my vision of it, as well as Bono's and the Edge's vision of it. What ends up on stage is, is I mean, there should be no division between the design and the direction. It should be seamless. I know I have a reputation for using rate stages a lot, um, but it's not true that I use them all the time. And when I do use them, they're there for a purpose. I prefer to, to make quite big statements, big simple statements that um, help to illuminate the play, hopefully, perhaps, you know, comment on it. But, um, but certainly always at the back of my mind is, is the fact that I'm serving the play and I'm serving the director. Richard Hudson is one of the new generation of British theatre designers that have been making a big impact over the last four or five years. Before that, I think sort of theatre design was much more, much closer to the kind of literary idea of theatre, that basically when you went to the theatre or to an opera, you were going to get the text cleanly delivered. But instead of saying, this is the text, this is what we're supposed to be showing people, you say, actually, every work of art that's going to be performed consists of a wide range of elements, all sorts of submerged, sub subliminal ideas, some of which are perhaps not obvious at all. What the designers have been doing is to provide an, a context where those other ideas can be brought out. You can make something which can be read the way that people looking at, for example, a rock video will read it. Um, people are much more responsive to the, uh, what the film people call montage, editing things together, cutting away, using different elements. And I think it's that that has made somebody like Richard Hudson very attractive because he provides an environment where all of that can work very 
potently. Often we arrive at the first day of rehearsals um, with um, the model already prepared, with all the major decisions taken. And what was very exciting about this is that we had this eight weeks rehearsal period in Stratford, seven weeks rehearsal period in Stratford actually, that um, where, we, where I went into the rehearsal, the workshop period, without any ideas whatsoever. Uh, rather difficult at times to actually say to the actors, well, it's anything really, let's, let's just develop and see what, what happens. Um, and it was only during the rehearsal period that, that Richard's ideas began to, to, to cohere and I began to see the first models. I remember arriving at Richard's studio and being presented with two spectacular ideas. Um, and th there was a third spectacular idea. And together, at that particular moment, we arrived at the decision that that was the richness that we wanted to pick. The central image of the production, and I suppose the one that sets the style of the whole production, is the Corova milk bar, which appears in the production three times. And um, it's just, I, I have this, this, an illuminated sign telling us where we are, and this giant milk bottle, which comes on a hydraulic lift through that hole in the wall. And um, there's a lot of furniture. There are a lot of um, milk bar stools, again, all in white, with the entire cast as Corova milk bar um, customers sitting on them, and Alex and his droogs. And I think it's the opening scene too, and the, the, the blacks at the front will open very quickly, and, the, uh, and I imagine the lighting will be very bright. So I just want the first image to be extremely um, bold and just very strong. So the next move is to take that to the, the, um, to the Barbican, to Mike, um, and I'll discuss with him how things are to be made. And uh, Mike will have the, the set and the props and the furniture and things costed. Are there things that sort of hit you immediately is going to be problematic with that? Oh, yes, the doors. How, um, are, they, how are they going to work? How are the doors going to work? Um, how are they going to work? Well, we think we're going to do it on a wire system, uh, latching on and latching off each door as it's needed. Because there is one point in the production when all the doors open together quietly which um, I think is also another problem because basically the set is made of steel it'll be all metal and I think that in itself poses problems and what happens when you cost it if you think oh gosh I can't afford this well then we have to sit down with the director and the designer and work out what we have to cut because there's no way that these sort of things can go over budget So then this door opens right. automatically, and then we won't see anyone opening it. And this table will roll in on casters and come down to about there, I think. And the chandelier? And the chandelier will drop in at the same time. Is that over the table? Yeah. And over that's, the that, that is, of the that is practical. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and on the table are six cats, white sort of stuffed cats which Alex kicks around, and a large bust of Beethoven, um, which Alex kills the old lady with. Right. So that's um, got to be made pretty lightweight, I should think. And the cats, I mean, I think should be quite uh, floppy. They're sort of lying around, and then they get hurled about all over the place. So I uh, have to get somebody good to make this. <laughs> <laughs> This sort of set will basically be built by one contractor, but then all the props, the large props, will be done by other companies. We've got nine weeks, um, including Christmas, so basically it's, it's not a very long building period. The P. Kemp Group are theatre engineers and scenery builders. Now, what we receive from the designer is a model, and we receive a set of drawings. These drawings indicate what he requires in the set. Um, it is not possible to place these drawings directly into the workshop to manufacture the set. So we have to produce our own drawings from these to make it an engineering uh, possibility. And here we have a section through the whole assembly.
endeavor to assemble the set in our workshop. We follow this up by going into the theater, where necessary, making any modifications that might be required by the designer or sometimes by the director. I like the collaboration to be so close that every single moment of the production is discussed with the director. And, um, and the best directors, from my point of view, will take what you've given them and make it work. You know, once rehearsals start and, and once the cast get on the stage and the set is there for the first time and the costumes, then hopefully the whole thing will just mould together. I think there's a problem with the winches for opening the doors and it's something to do with them not being big enough. Um, I think if they put bigger winches in, they'll be able to open and shut the doors more quickly. So uh, they're going to change those later. I think everyone's happy at the moment? I think so. They're a bit worried that we're a bit behind uh, because nobody knows how long it'll take to actually set up the opening and the shutting of the doors. And obviously, we can't start a technical rehearsal without that in, in operation. How much time between now and the dress rehearsal? Uh, well, there's all, uh, all this evening and tomorrow morning. And then we're supposed to start a dress rehearsal tomorrow afternoon. The central image to the play for me in many ways is um, that of an urban hell. I think the play is situated in a world of destitution, in a world of uh, decay, in a world of uh, desolation, in a way. And this is where Richard's originality came in, because what he's, what he's constructed for us is a set which can both convey almost the sense of a Lucifer in hell, which is, which is the way that I, I begin to see the, the beginning of the play. Um, and then cap it's capable of terrific transformations with very deft touches. It can move from interiors to exteriors very, very quickly, and at the same time be immensely bold, with a boldness almost of a, of, of, of a comic strip. Flowing in your veins is a chemical substance patented by the late Dr. Ludovico. So it wasn't like vitamins? Oh, it wasn't like vitamins. Oh, a video, a Cali Vonny trick, an act of treachery. Sod you, you won't do it again. Don't fight against us, please. There's no point in your fighting. You can't get the better of us. Presently, Bransneys. I don't mind about the ultraviolence and all that cow. I put up with that, but it's not fair on the music. It's not fair I should feel ill when I'm sluicing lovely Ludwig van. All that goes to show is you're an evil bunch of bastards and I shall never forgive you, sods. The Clockwork Orange opens at the Barbican tomorrow night.